thank you very much. So first of all, I want to thank the organizers for having me at this conference. And today I would like to talk about transporting closed one-dimensional systems, integrable model and universality at low temperatures. So what I'm going to tell you about is based on this uh, series of works which started in 2016 and that I have been done, I have done in collaboration with these people. Maurizio and Jacopo that are here, but also Mario Conlura, Lorenzo Piroli and Pasquale Calabrese. Okay, so the outline of the talk is as follows. I will start by reviewing the non-equilibrium dynamics, starting from a particular class of initial states, which I call piecewise homogeneous states, and are basically obtained by joining together two homogeneous states. And I will try to convince you that these kinds of states give, <coughs> give a very useful setting to study transport in closed systems, so in the presence of unitary dynamics. Then I will move to consider uh, transporting integrable models, giving examples in particular for the XXC spin on half chain. And uh, finally, I will consider some universal features um, emerging for critical systems, for generic critical systems in the low temperature transport. So basically when you join together two thermal states at very low temperature. Okay, so let's get started with the first part. So as usual in the framework of non-equilibrium dynamics, what you do is you start from some initial state, psi node, you initiate your system in some initial state, psi node, and then you evolve your many-body system using some Hamiltonian H, uh, nice and well-behaved, uh, short-ranged and so on, of which psi naught is not an eigenstate nor a finite superposition of eigenstates. And so you construct a time-evolving state like that. And the relevant questions in this framework are about uh, the behavior of observable so you uh, take some observables, you take their expectation values on the time-evolving state, and uh, the simplest question uh, you can ask is whether this quantity here will, will relax to some time-independent value at very large times. Okay, This is a non-trivial question since the full system is evolving using uh, unitary dynamics. And if relaxation of this uh, quantities happens, um, is it possible to compute the stationary value without following the entire dynamics? That's the, uh, like the basic question you ask in this framework. So <coughs> this problem has been studied quite a lot in the last years by a lot of people, many of them are also in the audience, and uh, in the case where, uh, which I will uh, from now on call the homogeneous case, so when both the initial state and the time-evolving Hamiltonian are homogeneous, so translational invariant, then uh, a lot is known. There are many reviews. Here I'm listing a bunch of recent ones. So basically, in that case, it has been, uh, let's say, argued that the time-evolving state, rho of t, can be replaced by a stationary state, rho s, in the expectation value of local in-space observables. At, at infinite time. So you, you can do something like this. And also, of course, in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, So you have your time evolving state, and for large times you can just replace it by some stationary state. Uh, local in space observables are uh, special because I'm always taking Hamiltonian, which are uh, short range in space. Um, <coughs> then the point is how to determine this rho s, and uh, basically, this, this state here can be determined by knowing the local and quasi-local conservation laws of the system. And by local conservation law, I mean a conservation law which can be expressed as a sum or an integral of some local density, some, something acti acting non-trivially only on one side, basically of a spin chain. And quasi-local has the same structure, but now this density has exponential tails. Okay. So uh, once you know the full set of local and quasi-local conservation laws of your system, you can represent your state, 
your stationary state in this way, where these lambdas here are some Lagrange multipliers, and are fixed by imposing that the expectation value of the uh, average density of these charges in the initial state is the same as that in the stationary state. Okay? And you require that for all your charges. Uh, another mm, uh, point which is worth mentioning is that this one here is just a one possible representation of this stationary state. You have in general many, as if, like this is very much like uh, what happens in uh, standard statistical mechanics when you have like one canonical uh, representation, but also the mi micro canonical and the canonical one. So in this case, uh, you can represent this rho s also uh, as a single projector, as a projector on a single eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, okay? And you have this freedom, basically, because the only thing you are fixing over OS is this expectation value of local charges, uh, sorry, of, of, of local observables, okay? And uh, there are two extreme cases of this construction, uh, namely integrable models where the number of these local and quasi-local concert charges scales with the system size, so it's a macroscopic number, and the, the, like, uh, the opposite case is the so-called generic case, where there is only the Hamiltonian, since the uh, evolution is unitary and the Hamiltonian is time-independent, is always there, is always one of these cube. Okay, but the question we want to ask now is what happens when either this, the initial state or the Hamiltonian are not homogeneous? Uh, what does it change? Can we say something? So, <coughs> during this talk, I will consider a very simple case. So, I will consider the case where the Hamiltonian is always translational invariant, while the only, uh, let's say, inhomogeneity is in, in the initial state, which has uh, this structure. So, basically, it's made by connecting together two different homogeneous states, which I call row left and row right. Okay? And uh, such, uh, such a choice is uh, very useful to study transport. Basically, um, th this kind of initial state uh, represents this uh, uh, simple physical situation where you have a left bath represented by your row left, then you have a right bath basically represented by your right, and then you have some non-trivial thing happening uh, in, the, in the region close to the junction. So let's uh, try to see it more in detail. But first, uh, let me just write an example of, of those states. Like, for example, these are just uh, two thermal states at different temperature and chemical potential. And this, for example, this choice is used to study uh, thermal transport, so transport of energy and, and also spin. OK? So. <coughs> Okay, let's try to understand some basic features of the time evolution from these kind of states. First of all, uh, I always uh, consider the thermodynamic limit, so the volume of the system is sent to infinity. Basically, these two regions here, these and these, are infinitely, uh, are like going to be plus and minus infinity in space. And I also consider uh, normally spin chains, at least in the first part of my talk. And uh, I assume Lieb Robinson bounds. And uh, the, the presence of a Lieb Robinson bound, so a maximal velocity for the propagation of information basically in, in the chain. And so this immediately causes the appearance of a light cone. What I mean is that if I consider the expectation value of some local observable in my initial state with time evolved, and I take my, uh, uh, my uh, local observable far enough from the junction, so basically for distances larger than some maximal velocity times t on the left or on the right, then I will just see uh, the time evolution of a homogeneous system. Basically, as yes, like uh, uh, just a homogeneous case I discussed before, where the initial state is just row right or or row left. So uh, basically, this is uh, what uh, allows you to uh, what allows you to make this identification between this. Uh, um, like two regions out of the light cone and uh, the bus. But the uh, non-trivial question is uh, about what happens in this region here in the middle, okay? 
And uh, what I'm going to argue is that I expect very different behavior in this region for in integrable and non-integrable spin chains or, or systems in general. So if you consider non-integrable system, then you expect that at large enough times there will be a local terminal equilibrium inside here. And this means, for example, that there will be no currents, at least no odd currents, for example, no thermal current, no energy current. And, and this, is, uh, this has been observed also numerically, for example, in this work by Biela de Luca et al. of 2016. And in this case, there is also accordance with the Fourier law, so basically that the uh, energy current is proportional to the derivative of uh, the energy density. Uh, because like in, in, the, in this setting, the size of the system, which is the size of this light cone here, is proportional to T. So this uh, gradient here will be something like the difference between the energy on one side and the energy on the other, divided by the length of the system, which is T, and goes to zero at infinite times. Okay? No, in like that uh, is not forever. Is um, that result is a for conformal field theory, and it's expected to hold up to some time scale. I will discuss that later. So we, we I, I can just uh, uh, consider that later. Okay. Instead, um, for integrable systems, what I just said is not true. Uh, there can be uh, exotic steady states, basically those GGEs I was describing before. So there, there can be some position-dependent GGE inside this light cone here, and so uh, this allows for the presence of for the presence of non-zero currents, and there there is no Fourier law in here. Okay. Um, so basically, this is what uh, should convince you that studying this kind of setting in integrable models is interesting because there will be some non-trivial uh, currents to compute. So let's uh, move to consider integrable models. So um, I will now give a very simple argument for making what is, in my opinion, a very reasonable assumption that I then will verify by comparing with numerics. So um, the idea is that integrable models are characterized by stable quasi-particle excitations, which move ballistically and propagate information throughout the system. So, uh, if I consider this setting, what I have is that uh, let me start by considering a reference frame um, moving away from the junction at some fixed velocity zeta, which I will from now on call ray. Okay? I take a reference frame moving away from the junction at velocity, uh, velocity zeta. And uh, the first thing to observe is that depending on zeta, this frame will receive different quasi-particles coming from different sides. For example, if I consider a quasi-particle of uh, velocity v, for this zeta it comes from the left, but if I change zeta, the same quasi-particle will come from the right. So basically this should tell you that uh, different uh, reference frames, observable measured on this, on this different reference frame, should see different physics. So you should expect uh, a different behavior. The third point you can uh, try to make is that also observables in these uh, moving frames will relax due to the phasing, basically as it happens in the homogeneous case I was describing before. And if you put all of these together, then what you conclude is that at infinite times, you expect that you can replace in the expectation values of local observables Again, some stationary state, but now this stationary state that you will put will depend on the velocity zeta. So you, you take an observable moving away from the junction of velocity zeta, and depending on zeta, you will uh, replace a different stationary value here. So instead of what we had before, that was just a single stationary state, here now we have a full family of uh, stationary state, which we call locally quasi stationary state. And now, like, in order to verify this assumption, so this is just an assumption, I will assume this. In order to verify that, uh, I should be able to find a way to compute, to determine this rho s of zeta, otherwise it's very hard. 
to have any comparison. Okay? And uh, the idea to do that is, again, to try and use information and constraints coming from this infinite family of conservation laws. So here I'm considering the integrable case. So, uh, so I have a macroscopic number of these um, conservation laws. And basically, before, the information given by the average density was enough. I could fix everything. And by before, I mean the homogeneous case. In the homogeneous case, you can fix everything just by using the average density. But here, this is not enough. And it's very simple to see it, like, because you just, oh, sorry. You just go back and understand that basically uh, the regions where the uh, state looks like the, the thermal bath is uh, infinitely large, while instead the non-trivial region is just large T. So when you do any average, you will see only the, the, like the, out, the, the region out of the light cone. Okay, so um, the, the idea instead is to consider really a, the density of these uh, local conservation laws and to write the continuity equation for these densities. So you, you take the derivative of the, of the density and this is written in terms of the related current, okay? of the difference of the same current in two neighboring sites. This is just following from the fact that Q is conserved. And now you take the expectation value of this equation here on your time-evolving state, okay? and uh, you write it something like that, uh, and, and you take the limit of j, so the position of this uh, uh, q, and time to infinity. So you replace the expectation value with the expectation value of your uh, locally quasi-stationary state. Okay? You use the assumptions, the assumption I made before, and you write this equation. So you can write uh, one equation like that for each local and quasi-local concert charge, and so you will have a macroscopic number of equations, and you have some boundary condition, which is given by the values in the two, oh, sorry, uh, in the two um, homogeneous states that are out of the light cone. Okay, and now uh, it's it's like you just need to solve those equations in some way. Okay, a good uh, represent. Okay, a good representation to uh, solve those equation, those equations, like uh, to uh, collect all of them together, is given by uh, the thermodynamic Betti-Ansa description. So in this description, you use, you describe eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, or better, collections of many eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, using some root densities. So these root densities can be interpreted as momentum distributions of some quasi-particles. So they are basically the generalization of mode occupation numbers uh, in free systems, okay? So free systems, you can have mode occupation numbers, so basically they're just free particles. Here, instead, you will have those non-trivial particles, and you will have many, in general, many family, uh, families of them. So I will label these, uh, the, the like different species or families of these quasi-particles with this index n and in general there will be ns of them. And, um, uh, these root density are basically momentum distributions, or more precisely, rapidity distributions <coughs> for those quasi-particles. And uh, the important thing is, there is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these root densities and the expectation values of local and quasi-local conserved charges. This has been found by uh, N.A., Jacob, and many other people. So basically, you can write the expectation value. Of, I mean, was there ever the, the most difficult part? But okay. So you can write basically the expectation value of this uh, charge density in terms of the root densities here, and each charge density is characterized by a function. This is just a known function that is model dependent, as is, and it's normally called bear charge. Okay, but this was uh, known before. What was not known before, until 2016, was how to compute the expectation value of currents on the same, on the same um, uh, state described by the root densities. So this has been like the main breakthrough of these uh, papers by in 2016, uh, one by Yolaja, Benjamin Doyon, and Takato Yoshimura, and the other by us. 
uh, they did it for relativistic integral quantum field theories, and they actually had a proof of it, and instead uh, proved it, like, like argued on the basis of a semi-classical picture, and we like, had some numerical checks. Basically, the formula for the expectation value of the current looks very similar to the one of the charge, so it has the same stuff, this rho and q. What changes here is this, uh, the presence of this v of k, which is the thrust velocity of excitations on top of the state described by the root density. Basically, it gets dressed by the interactions. You can write uh, the equations for it. This is uh, like a set of linear integral equations for this uh, v, <coughs> for this v um, of, of lambda. Sorry, here, never mind, this index C there sh shouldn't be here, it's just a typo. And, um, and these A and T are just some model-dependent functions. But basically the idea is that the particle moving, since there is interaction moving, its velocity gets changed by the presence of uh, other particles. Okay? If there are no other particles, this row here is zero, so it gets cancelled, then it's just some constant number. But when other particles are present, then the, val the value of the velocity changes. Okay? It gets modified by, by scattering with the other, with the other quasi-particles. This T is really uh, the let's see, scattering kernel. Okay? Uh, so now we have the expression for the expectation value of the charge, the one of the current. And what we can, we, what we can do is the following. So we... Sorry? Yeah. Sure. This one? The current operator is not known, yeah. No, what defines the operator J is, uh, sorry, oh god. Um, what defines the operator J is uh, this equation here, basically. That is the expectation value of it. Numerically, you can compute it. For example, I, we did in uh, XXZ, and for the first few currents, so you, you, you can use this equation and compute explicitly these currents numerically. And uh, of course, we, we couldn't do for the infinite family, we did for the first few, and uh, we checked on a thermal state, so at equilibrium, and the agreement with the DMRG was up to, like, the DMRG, the, sorry, not the DMRG, was up to the DMRG precision. Uh, okay. Yeah. So basically, you have the expression for the expectation value of the charge, the one of the current. So now you uh, just need to represent your locally quasi stationary state micro canonically. So you represent it by a single eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, characterized by the root densities, where now these root densities will depend on the ray zeta. Okay, the, the state depends on the rate zeta, so also the densities will have a dependence on the rate zeta. So I just take my equation of before, I plug in the expectation values I showed you in the previous slide, and what I get is this expression. Okay, but now since uh, this should be true for a complete set of charges, it means that the, um, the equality, like the, the fact that um, this thing is zero, should mean that the integrand itself should vanish. Okay? So we get to this equation, okay? which was the main equation derived in those, in those papers. Uh, just uh, characterizing the, <coughs> the rate dependence or the x and t dependence of the root densities. Okay? So we now have uh, a way to check our conjecture before, because this gives us a concrete way of computing stuff, of computing the root densities. So I will do it um, in the concrete example of the XXZ spin chain. So uh, that's the Hamiltonian, of course, all of you know it very well. And um, so this is the phase diagram at zero temperature. Uh, there is a gapless phase when this parameter here, delta, is, min is uh, of absolute value smaller than one, and then and otherwise it's gapped. Uh, interestingly, there is different physics uh, for, for like in these two regimes. Physics is different also at finite energy density, not only in the ground state. 
because there is a different structure of concert charges. Uh, if, if I have time, I will uh, try to discuss it later. Okay, but uh, let's get to the result. So here I'm considering delta uh, equal to the cosine of gamma, so between minus one and one. And in particular, I take some special values of delta such that the number of those species of quasi-particles is finite and it's actually quite small. For example, when it is pi over three here, there are only th three species. Uh, like pi over two is the free case. And these are other values. So you see this is the profile of the energy density comparing our prediction, which is the black line, with dots that are TDMRG results. Okay? And these are different times. And uh, what I'm plotting here is for this, uh, when at the sudden junction the two thermal states at different temperature. So this is the result for the energy density, and this one is the result for the energy current, and as you see, the current is clearly non-zero. Okay, uh, but this is uh, even too good, because um, in, in this case, the, uh, the states are uh, stationary if you go far enough away from the junction, so the convergence of TDMRG is uh, extremely fast and good, so, but you can study some more complicated cases. For example, this one, uh, so this case here, uh, as you see, has a non-trivial evolution also out of the light cone because you are joining together two states that are not eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So this is the profile of energy density, for example. And again, here I'm plotting different profiles of different charges, uh, comparing with the TMRG data for t equal 10. So there are some deviations, but they are due to the fact that t is quite small. Okay. Um, you can do so I will do it in time. Okay, I will quickly do also this part then. Okay, uh, you you can also consider um, the case of delta larger than one, but uh, in this case um, there is some caveat. So if you join together two states such that the sign of the magnetization of the two states is the same, everything I said before still holds. Okay. So here you see are the results of. Uh, for energy density and magnetization, again, joining some thermal states. But something strange happens when you join together two states with, oppo with opposite magnetization. Basically, in this case, from, from the numerics, uh, you, you see that there is some discontinuity in the x over t profile I'm showing. And since like, I'm plotting stuff as, as a function of x over t, a discontinuity just means that there is a range, a region where the profile varies on a different scale. So it's sub-ballistic. It varies on a smaller scale. Um, so how to explain that? Well, uh, the problem is not really in um, the uh, theory I was... Um, presenting you before, but it's more in the TBA description. So basically the problem is that in this case, all conserved charges are spin-flip symmetric. And this means since the uh, charges are, uh, like knowing all the charges, uh, you, you know all their densities, it means that if two states differ just by the sign of the total magnetization, they have the same root densities. Okay? So if I take uh, two states which are just uh, one and the one where I flip all the spins, I, I see nothing in my x over t profile because the, the root densities I, I use are exactly the same. So there will be no variation, the two will be the same. And uh, this solution to this, so I of course will not be able to describe the, the jump. The solution to this problem is to add another parameter in the description of the state telling you about the sign of the magnetization. And basically, uh, a state with this parameter here uh, uh, will behave as follows. So if you take the expectation value of a spin flip even, observable, the df doesn't matter. And otherwise, uh, if you take the expectation value of a spin odd, observable will be f times the expectation value of the state with, uh, like with, oh, with, with, with positive um, magnetization. Okay, so you modify your microcanonical representation of the L of the LQSS. So you add also this uh, uh, sine parameter f, which now depends on zeta, and using the continuity equation for the 
magnetization, you can write uh, the continuity equation for this uh, sine parameter, and you find that it's just a step function. So it jumps at some point, and you can determine the velocity at which it jumps. And uh, interestingly, it corresponds so um, in this phase of the model, the number of species of quasi-particles is infinite. It, like at this ns, the number of species of quasi different quasi-particles goes to infinity in this phase, and uh, the velocity at which the sign flips corresponds to the velocity of the infinitely long, let's say, of, of, the, of the particle with n equal to infinity. Okay? Uh, so if you plug this information in, and then you uh, try to compute profiles of local observables, what you see is that this is the energy density, which is spin flip even. So uh, we don't add uh, the sign. And uh, you, s you see that uh, here the, the convergence of numerics is lower, but it seems to go in the right direction. And instead, if you consider the uh, expectation value of the magnetization, which is odd, you flip the profile at some uh, ray, which is given by the equation of, uh, I was showing you before, and this describes quite well the uh, profile. Again, there is some slow convergence close to this jump. Okay, uh, so this approach here tells you where the jump is, so where this uh, sub-ballistic reason is in our uh, x over t uh, space, but doesn't tell you anything about what happens in that sub-ballistic region. But uh, I mean, if you have seen Jacopo's talk, you have seen some like interesting developments also in that direction. Okay, so let me now uh, change topic. So it's a good point to ask questions if you have some. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's because of this uh, structure of conserved charges. So in the critical regime, you have some charges which are spin flip odd. So basically, if you know all the charges, you, you have information also about the sign of the magnetization. In other words, if I take a state and its spin-flip counterpart, they have different root densities in the critical regime. Instead, they have the same root densities in the mm, gapped regime. Okay? Uh, so you are using uh, two sets of uh, conserved quantities in the critical regime. Yeah, in, in, in the critical regimes, I, I'm, I'm always using all the conserved uh, quantities, but in the critical regimes, it happens that there are also these uh, odd ones, which are not present yeah. in, the, in the... Do you use them for your calculations, or do you um, keep them out of the calculation? I mean... Uh, I, I, yeah, I use all of them, because... All of them, I see. Yeah, because basically, it, in order to yeah. pass from the description of charges to descriptions yeah. of root density, I, I really need all the charges, otherwise I can't write that equation. I really need to use all the charges. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Other questions? No? Okay, so now we change slightly the topic. So now we consider uh, generic systems, so non-integrable systems, but we focus on the low temperature uh, physics. So. What we do is we take a generic critical system and we start from a piecewise homogeneous state, but in this case we only consider thermal states. Okay? And we consider the case where the temperatures of these two thermal states are different, but both very small. Okay? In this case, there is, uh, as you were pointing out before, um, Th there is a um, um, description in terms of conformal field theory. So basically, for small enough t, you uh, can describe the dynamics, you can control the dynamics only uh, using low energy modes. Of course, this at some point won't be true anymore. So this is a picture I took from the review of Benjamin Doyon and Denise Bernard. So at some point here, of course, the description will break down, but there will be some window, some a uh, large time window, some transient, for which I can just describe my system uh, using a conformal field theory, for example, so using only low energy modes. In particular, uh, there are some CFT predictions for the transport of energy, which are of this form, so are basically three steps. 
So the charges are of some value out of the Litecoin on the right, then they have a different value in the Litecoin, which is constant, and then a different value again out of the Litecoin on, on, on the left. This is the energy current and this is the energy density. So the expressions are, uh, they look like that. Okay? So you see the, the value of the charge is like uh, totally universal. It doesn't depend even on the velocity oh, of the current, sorry. Okay? And the question I want to, uh, con to ask now is this nice description holds for the, uh, uh, the transport of energy. So if I consider the profile of energy density and current, but what can I say for generic observables? For example, the spin in the gapless regime of XXZ or the particle density in Lieb-Linear or whatever else, like other observables which are not the energy and the energy current. Okay, so one can uh, do like the simplest calculation, just assuming that again, low, only low energy modes matter in the dynamics of small t, and so basically you can do a calculation in the uh, Lattinger liquid approximation. So you approximate your Hamiltonian by just a linear dispersion. And you do what is uh, nicely explained in Jamarki's book, for example. And then you get conformal-like predictions for generic charges. So you, you get basically the same expression I was showing you before, but now there will be some constants here which are non-universal and depend on the charge, but the structure of the profile really looks the same, okay? And the question I want to ask is, is this really universal? So does this hold really or, or not? So to answer this question, what I will do is I include the dominant irrelevant terms and I will try to see what changes, okay? If, if these profiles are changing in some way. So uh, the, 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 the irrelevant terms have two main effects. They induce a curvature in the dispersion so they add some curvature term like that. And they also, of course, add interactions between quasi-particles. Uh, but if I take T small enough, uh, it has been argued that basically you can neglect the interaction bit and you can focus only on, the, only on this curvature term. And the idea is that the density of uh, excitations is uh, a non only very close to the uh, Fermi momentum, uh, so where, where the energy is zero, basically. And at, in that particular point, the curvature of the dispersion dominates over the interactions. This is explained, for example, in this review by Iman Beko, Schmidt, and Glasman. Okay, so I'll keep just, basically, I'll just uh, keep three particles, as in the latitude liquid, but now I add a curvature in the dispersion, okay? And I do the calculation again. So what, what I find is the following. So the, there is a region here. If I go uh, far enough from the transition point, so from the, like, the point where there was the step before, okay? if I go far enough from there, the description of the linear Latinger liquid doesn't change. If I add this curvature, it's the same as before, basically. I just uh, change um, the values of this. Uh, of these um, uh, non-universal coefficients here, but we didn't care about them in, a, in any case. And uh, notice that they remain invariant in the case of energy density and current, as it should uh, following the conformal field theory prediction. Okay, but if I instead uh, look at the region which is uh, of order t close to the transition point, I find a different result for the profiles. Basically, I find that all the profiles of all charges and currents are all proportional to the same function, this d, which is a picked function of this form. Okay? Uh, I mean, there is an explicit expression for it. And uh, notice that in this region, the uh, smallest low temperature correction is linear in the temperature. Uh, previously, instead, uh, Previously, instead, was proportional to t squared. Okay, so this is larger. Oh, sorry. So this this correction here is larger at small t. Okay. So we we basically have a region around here where um, where the the let's say the the, the simple uh, linear Latinger liquid picture doesn't hold, and there is this uh, new behavior. 
Notice that in the case of energy density and current, the coefficients in front of this new term vanish. Okay, so the the conformal uh, result still holds. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, uh, I will just uh, tell you the result of this reasoning. So if this holds for all the charges and currents, it will hold for any observable, for the profile of any observable. You will again find that the profile of any observable will be proportional to the same function d around these uh, transition points. But let's see some examples so we understand better. For example, this here is the XXZ chain, and using the integrable case because I want to be able to produce some uh, exact results. So uh, this is uh, um, that kind of uh, the, the profile in the XXZ spin chain. Here, the temperatures I took are extremely small, 1 over 125 and 1 over 250. And I'm zooming over this uh, on, on this region uh, close to the transition point. So you see these red curves here, okay? are the linear Lattinger liquid prediction. As you see, they are uh, like they, they seem the same. They, they are very small because like the, the temperatures I took are extremely small. But this like uh, bump feature here is uh, very well visible. And these curves I'm reporting in this case are uh, just obtained by taking the, the form of before and fitting for the parameters A, B, C, and D, so the coefficients in front of the curves, okay? So this is just how you got these results. Ah, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't specify that, of course, I'm considering the gapless uh, uh, point, like a region of XXZ, okay? And in the gapless region, only the, par the quasi-particles of the first species, they become gapless, all the other are gapped, and uh, they don't matter for the dynamics, okay? But uh, you can confirm this result because if for XXC you can do an analytical low temperature expansion of the, let's say, hydrodynamics profiles I was showing you before. So you can take the solution of that continuity equation for the root density and uh, you, you can compute it in uh, this low temperature expansion. So uh, these are some results. Um, so this is for, like, it's very difficult to see, but they are again the same profiles I'm always showing. So this is the energy density. As you see here, there is no, no bump. This is the energy current, and again, there is no bump. But if I look, for example, at the spin, the spin has a very large feature, okay, here. And this is, again, uh, the spin current, again, another large feature. And these are values for different temperatures. And these are uh, smaller temperatures, so the, our, like, the result of our asymptotic expansion, which is the full line, agrees perfectly with the numerical solution of the continuity equation. Okay, and uh, you can find so in this uh, analytical expansion, you of course can find the explicit form of these profiles, and they look like that. So basically, the, fun the functional form agrees with the nonlinear Lattinger liquid prediction. And uh, you can find the exact values of the coefficients, and in particular, you can also reproduce the CFT prediction. So you, you find analytically from the uh, continuity equation that actually you recover the uh, CFT prediction for energy current and uh, energy density profile. Okay, so that was all I wanted to say. So I thank you for your attention. For this last part of nonlinear yes. liquids, um, first small question I kind of missed: What controls the width of your this the universal function? What the does, temperature does it scan, t is it linear with t? t linear with t, yeah. Um, but um, so when you start including curvature that are different, uh, possible and elastic scattering that could take place for quasi-particles that give them a lifetime that otherwise is infinite in linear light change liquid regime. So I'm kind of surprised that this is controlled by temperature, but not that inelastic scattering time. Yeah, well, the idea is that if uh, all of this holds for temperatures which are extremely small, of course, like if, if you take I some mean. finite temperature, yeah. 
So if, if temperature are, are like the, the basic assumption uh, relying like on, on, on which everything here relies is that there is some time scale such that for very small temperatures such that you can describe your system using a linear Latinger liquid or a conformal field theory. But yeah, of course, I mean, you, you should. For example, sorry, the, okay, so, yeah, so the uh, thing you're saying. Reformulate, sorry. I reformulate. Yeah. Uh, when you say temperature is small, when you include the curvature, you get the new scale smaller than what? So when I say that temperature is small, I mean that is small enough such that I can uh, neglect the interaction, the interaction part. Well, not, not, I mean, yeah, also some interaction scale, like uh, that is fixed, so if I take this small enough. Okay, I mean. But like, uh, just notice that uh, what you are saying would also be true in the XXZ case, right? And in the XXZ case, I have, I can compare with the exact solution. What I was showing you before was the comparison between this approximation and the exact solution. Yeah, in the interval case. Yeah, yeah. No, no, okay, okay, fine. But like, there are other quasi-particles. Like, it's it's not th just this simple description. There are there are interacting quasi-particles. But okay, yeah, the, of course, with infinite lifetime. <coughs> Again, a question to the gap XXZ chain okay. and the, uh, this uh, time evolution of, the, of, of this jump in magnetization. So if it's about the sign change, then probably uh, a step from zero to something finite would not pr uh, present any problems. Did people um, calculate that? Yeah, we, we did. We did. And then everything is fine? Then yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's running zero, and then yeah, it, it, it approaches this jump in a continuous way. That's, that's what it seems. And then you have better agreement between the well, semi-analytical calculations and the DMRG calculations? I mean, what uh, you showed that showed these wiggles or something? No, I think uh, the, uh, I actually don't remember, but like, I think the agreement is very similar. Sim similar to what I was okay. showing you, to this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe we look again at that. No, I'm going the opposite direction. Yeah. Ah, but I mean, here so it's like I, I wouldn't complain ah. for this agreement. Well, this is time uh, ten and yeah. twenty, mm -hmm. and you see, I mean, the symbols are approaching the curve. What I mean is, uh, if you started with uh, a left domain with positive and a right domain with zero. Yeah, uh, it, it, I think it will look similar to that. Just on this side, it will be zero, and I don't need. I, I will not need now to insert my sign. It will just be. Uh, but still not so good. So the my question is then: Is the sign really the problem, or the sign detecting operator the problem, or something else? I don't understand what, what, what you mean by problem. Yeah, if I look at the right diagram, I mean, you pointed out deviations, yeah? Yeah, yeah, sure, but like, this is just because uh, the TDMRG can run only for finite oh. times, and these are just the slower time scales for relaxation. Oh. But I mean, you see, they are like, if I increase time, they go at least in the direction of the curve. Well, but uh, as I was trying to say before, this phenomenological term is really you should use from the beginning in TBA. Like in TBA, this problem doesn't emerge because you normally don't, like y you can always fix the magnetization of your state. And so then you, you construct your root densities on, like, on top of that, on that, uh, on that state. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is, just, uh, this is just how to propagate that sign. Maurizio. 
please. Yeah, there is a, you, you approach the discontinuity in a continuous way. That's so. Yeah, you you accept, like you you get like uh, the yeah. So if you go to zero, like uh, if from zero you go to negative values, there is the discontinuity, and like you gradually approach it. Like okay, more questions, comments. Let's thank Bruno again. <clears throat> so now the bus will take you back to the...